like again with Joshua Sachs, I'm the Deputy Secretary for Natural Historic Resources for the Commonwealth of Virginia. I work for Governor Northam and for Secretary Jennings and cover a broad portfolio that includes some aspects of uh, our work on flooding and resilience. I cover land conservation and history and transportation issues, climate issues, all sorts of stuff. Um, and tonight I'm going to talk to you about some of the things that Commonwealth is trying to do with regard to flooding and resilience. And the goal here tonight is really not for me to just talk at you. That would be fun or that interesting. What the goal here is, is to do is to have a little bit of a conversation. And no one's going to be put on the spot, but if we can talk, that's going to be great. Because what you're going to see, what I'm going to tell you about is a plan that is in its absolute interest. Everywhere in Virginia, everywhere in the United States, everywhere in the world, we are probably a little bit late to the client or part of me to the flooding problem. Various impacts are happening and we are seeing so much more flooding so quickly all across the state, not just in Virginia Beach, not just in the mountains, but everywhere across the state. And that's why Virginia is trying to step up and do more. So mostly I'm going to tell you a few things along the way and then we'll pause at certain points and have a little bit of conversation. I'm not from here. I don't know the area as well as any of you. I don't know much about the Road project. Um, so you hopefully will tell me some of that as we go tonight, and I can learn a little bit. And what's really important about all that is um, our team here is really capturing the conversation. And at the end, what we do at the end of every meeting is we have maps up here, and we ask people in the room to come show us on the map where the problems are and things, because we are on this journey, but we understand there's a lot we don't know. And we have to learn it from all of you, from people who are in the communities, things like that. So that's why, how many of these are you doing? 40, 20? A lot. Um, 32. 32 meetings, right? And just in this batch of meetings to do outreach. Um, we're trying, so that's, that's the goal of tonight. Um, and if you can go to the next slide for me, we'll show you just a little bit of an agenda so you know what to expect. We did the first part. And I'm going to do all the rest, but first I'm just going to tick through a couple of really quick slides because I can't talk about flooding to a group of people without going through these next few slides. So if you click on the next one for me, um, whenever we talk about flooding, it's really important to just tell everyone that flooding is really serious um, and people need to take it seriously. You should be asking yourself various questions. If you are in flood zones, do you have flood insurance? Do you know where you would go? Do you have a plan? Things like that. Next slide, please. Um, again, we just want to remind people that a small amount of water might look like a small amount, but it can have tremendous impact. You see on that slide, 12 inches of water can move a vehicle. We see that happen in Virginia. Um, so people just need to be careful. If you don't know how deep it is, you know, be away from it. And then one more slide. Um, you should know your community's resilience plan. You should have your own plan and check those out and be prepared. So when flooding happens, you can protect yourself. Next slide. Thank you. I'm legally required to do that. Um, now we get that. Let's start our conversation. So first, what is resilience? These slides say coastal resilience. Let's start by talking about that for one second. I think in this place, in, in, in our meeting tonight in Aquila, Maybe there's a little debate about whether we're in the coastal zone or not. For the purposes of Virginia's coastal master planning, we are in the coastal zone, okay? For the purposes of, you know, walking home tonight, it might not feel that way, and I get that too. Um, so let's just recognize that when we see things that say coastal, we mean the whole coastal zone. Um, and ultimately, we're gonna have to have a conversation about the entire commonwealth. Um, so let's not get hung up on that, but we'll, we'll just go over that, okay? So what do we mean by resilience generally? We mean the community's ability to get back on its feet, basically. We want it so when a flood happens, and it will happen, that it can move through quickly, and we can get back on our feet quickly. That the, that the locality that is hit with a flood can get back to life as normal. People can go to work, businesses can open up again, uh, supply chains can happen, 
or can continue, uh, people can get to the hospital, all those things. And whatever we can do ahead of time to prepare for flooding is how resilient we will be. There are not a ton of options. At the end of the day, it can well really be boiled down to build up and stronger or divert water or find a somewhere else to go. Those are sort of where our options are. You can bundle them lots of different ways, but those are our choices. Um, and we need to, to use all of those tools to, to become more resilient. Can we go to the next slide? So it's also helpful for the conversation we're about to have to recognize that there are sort of three major ways that we get flooded. Um, and in this area, the rainfall flooding is going to be the primary way we get flooded. Um, we are seeing storms that come, they're a lot, what we call flashier. They happen faster, they dump a lot more rain, quick period of time. So there's less places for the water to go. Where I'm from, down in Richmond, we saw that a few weeks ago. I don't know if you saw, we saw water pouring over uh, the divider on I-95. It was very scary and intense. Um, tidal flooding happens more in sort of our seven cities areas and things where rising tides combine um, with, pardon me, where tidal influence combines with rising seas and sinking land and our outfalls for the water is inundated. I think that's happening a little less in this area, but, but always a concern. And then storm surge flooding is, you know, when a major hurricane or something pushes in at us and pushes the waves. And we can get some surges and flooding here in places like a quiet creek if, if the water, you know, the wind come the right direction. But imagine you get small amounts of that regularly and, you know, big storm perhaps get bigger amounts. So that's just a sense of types of flooding. And if we can go to the next slide, please. Here's what that kind of means in, 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 the, in Virginia. It means that over 6 million people, about 70% of all Virginians live in the coastal zone. You all know that, you're part of it, and I'm sure you're seeing continued growth as, as DC and Frederickburg continue to grow. Um, in 2018 and 2019, we had nine major floods with over 1.6 billion in damages. And I think we can all agree, things seem to be getting worse, not better. Um, and again, down in the sort of Hampton Roads area, we are seeing the ground actually sinking as well, so we're draining the aquifers, and the sea level rising, compounding our problem. And if we can now pivot, we'll start to talk about some solutions. Can we get to the next slide? Um, oh, one more slide about what's causing the increased flooding. And again, I think you know all this, but it's just helpful to kind of lay it out for our conversation. Um, you know, I mentioned the sinking land, I mentioned the rising seas. We talked about the changing weather patterns and severe storms. And often people talk about hurricanes, and, and hurricanes are a fear, but uh, frankly, a, a nor'easter that kind of sits over us might be as scary in certain parts of the state. Um, and construction, the more uh, hard surface we put down, uh, the less place there is for the water to go. Natural systems, natural floodplains give the water places to roam. And when we put down a lot of concrete, we cause a, an array of problems, but we cause flooding problems, sometimes for our neighbors downstream, sometimes for our whole community. And that's something we need, need to be cognizant of. And as we start to do planning to be more resilient, we need to keep that in mind. Can we go to the next slide, please? All right. These maps are usually a little more dramatic, um, one on a bigger screen. Um, but what they are trying to show you is in a 40 year period, and if we go to the next slide, maybe we can see it a little bit better. That's the creek. In about a 40 year period, what you'll see, if I can walk over here, is right, if we look up here, And it starts to fill in some. If we look at this in the coastal areas, we see it even more. Um, nonetheless, the point it's trying to make these slides is in 40 years, things are going to be pretty different than they are now, and they will continue to get worse and worse. But again, this isn't the most dramatic of these slides that I've seen in different places. Um, but nonetheless, uh, and I used to think 40 years was forever, and now 42. And it doesn't feel like forever. 
Um, so I think it's really important that we kind of keep that in mind. Can we go to the next slide, please? So just one more look at it in a sort of a more granular, pixelated view, gives you the same kind of idea. Let's go to the next one. All right, this is where we start to get to have fun. This is where the conversation kicks in. So now that I've set the table and laid out some of that stuff, what I'd like to do is, is open it up. And if, if you'd be willing, I'd like to hear a tiny bit about what you consider flood problems, tell me about what the local issue is, or what you think the state should be doing, or what you think you need from the state. And if you click one more, there's one more slide with a few more suggested questions. No one has to answer any of these. Um, but these are just things to kind of get your thoughts going. And what we'll do is we'll talk for a few minutes. And then I will pull it back and I'm going to show you a little bit about the master plan and about the flood fund. But if I know a little bit, I can connect it more for our conversation. And then we'll talk about that. Does that sound okay to everybody? Absolutely. And I do I do we need a mic for them? Is that no? I think do we have we'll just we'll just share. It. Um, I'm gonna start off with this just because we had such a significant problem with um, the quiet district okay. and all along the quiet creek. But I'm gonna go specifically down further to terms of what we call Brook Road. The Brook Road is a road that runs along the creek. It's a historical railroad road that went out that follows that is old, right? Hundreds of years old. And who is just a cow And so it's by the creek. The creek is kind of changes path over the years, as you would expect. It's been in field from a development and for a normal segmentation of light curve. And then in addition to that, perhaps possibly the room is thinking, we don't know. But what happens to us is we have a thousand people or 350 houses. That gets stuck when it floods. And when it floods, we got pictures of our family. What basically what happens is the creek comes to the road. And they're, they're all merged and you can't get through. These people have no way out. You know, it's flood as well, or they are off the houses, the homes are up on hills. Okay. So they're away from it, but people have no way to get in and out. Yep. No egress or ingress. So they're stuck until that occurs. And so the thing is put, we call it down, the marble line. So uh, that's why we're super concerned. And we, Stanford County, are taking action specifically in that area, but it's not the only one. I talk about it because it's the only one that that really significant safety issue. Because back to your point in the slides, this is also an area that doesn't have cell phone coverage. So when you get stuck, and people do, because they're by God, I've been doing this for five years, I can drive through this water and tell you that now it's five years. So those things happen, people get stuck with that. Certainly we are misses, uh, we put up signs, we're doing everything we can to keep people aware of it. And as you know, the way fall, all the response we have is this past year. So that lays the ground for these guys to talk. And we know we have our, our experts here that have studied this area for us from here as well. Who I was gonna say, let me ask one question before we pass the microphone. Sure. Does the City or the county, county I mean, sorry, um, know what the solution is they want yet or not? We have an idea. Okay. We have several. But what we don't want to do is jump in this and say, we got to elevate the road. It's probably likely, probably likely the outcome. Um, what we are trying to do is look at this comprehensively. Uh, we've got a, we're spending over $100,000 to study study Brook Road specifically um, and look at the watershed along Acadie Creek and some areas straight to it to kind of understand um, what's really going on here, what impact did development have on the road, um, what does the future, what are the future elevations look like based on land use, based off of, um, based off of sea level rise. I think that was the DIMS model you were showing there. Um, so we provide that to our consultant as well to, to look at that, but we're really trying to forecast um, the desired level of service that we want for the road, um, determine what storm event is acceptable um, so that um, we still are maintaining access there and a fix the cost to that you know, in, in an elevation to set that up for a future grant. That's great. 
Who else? Anybody else have anything to share? Please.
Okay, so now let's get to the, let's talk a little bit about potential solutions. Can we go to the next slide? I'm going to tell you now about our community flood home and our master plan a little bit. Um, and I actually think I might have gotten the slides a little confused. So click on the next one real quick. Yeah, that's what I thought. We're going to go, we're going to have to jump around a tiny bit. I apologize. So let me start by talking about the Coastal Resilience Master Plan first. Virginia looked at a bunch of other states, states like Texas and Louisiana, or places like Manhattan, because they're the places that have stepped up and said, we're going to do something about this. And the way they've always articulated what they're going to do is through something they call a master plan. So we thought Virginia needs to have a master plan too, because flooding is just as serious here. More people live in the seven cities than live in New Orleans. Um, we have much greater economic impact in, you know, across Virginia than some of those states. We need to protect ourselves. And if you look at a nearby state like North Carolina and what they've gone through recently, um, you know, we need to start planning quickly. So we want to create a, a coastal resilience master plan. And what that means is a project-driven plan to solve the flooding problems. And that's what we sought out to do, and that's what we're going to put out in the next couple of weeks, um, is a coastal resilience master plan that sets up a bunch of kind of how we're thinking about this and starts with our first list of projects ever. And what we learned as we started gathering all these projects is that not all of the localities in Virginia are in the same place, not, not geographically. I mean, not in the same place in terms of where they are in the planning process. You're working really hard on dealing with the road. You know, in, in um, Norfolk, they already designed a flood wall, right? So they can say, hey, this is what we want. It's easier. Or they might have a whole array of stormwater projects that they've identified that maybe another locality hasn't yet identified. We recognize that, and that's part of what we're going to talk about. But also, when you create a plan at the state level, what you're able to do is to recognize that every locality is going to have their own plan and their own priorities, but there are some that are going to become statewide priorities, and some where the state is going to need to step in and help. And we need to sort of create, well, what is the universe of those things, or what are the, why is the state stepping in? And this first slide is, tells you a little bit about why we thought we needed, the state needed a, a master plan. One is, there needs to be a whole of government approach, right? We've all tried to solve this problem on our own for a long time, and we haven't gotten as far as we want. So localities need the state, did I do that? Sorry, localities need resources from the state. Um, we need the knowledge of the localities. Everybody needs us to bundle it together so we can go to the federal government and say, hey, give us that same kind of money that you give to those other states. Next time there's a Hurricane Sandy bill or something, you know, put us in there and having a master plan helps. Um, so a whole government approach. We wanted to ensure equity and what we found is that some communities were stepping up because they had the resources to step up or because they were socioeconomically communities that could do that. And there were other communities that there was a chance of them being left behind if someone didn't explicitly say, we need to be planning to protect everyone from flooding. So that is a core kind of principle in our master plan. Um, by taking a broader view, that means a couple things to us. It means we're going to use science all the time. Right? Science is our driver for this. Being able to forecast risk the best we can, being able to understand the flooding the best we can, being able to understand the resources that we need to protect the best we can, that's all part of our broader view and not something we're trying to add to this type of planning. Right? Each locality, I'm sure, is doing great stuff, but maybe we can learn from other localities or we can pull together, who knows? Um, and then there needs to be some funding resources. You can't just make up a plan that would cost billions of dollars and say, good luck. It just isn't going to work. So those are some of the goals we planned on for our Coastal Resilience Master Plan. Let me talk a little bit about the Coastal Resilience Master Plan and 
this place where we are right now. So the way the process has worked is every locality, I think through their PDC, their planning district commission, um, was asked for the, all the projects that you have already identified as flood control projects. And then they are reviewed by a, a committee that was appointed by the governor and experts and things. And we are trying to evaluate an array of criteria and, and come out with that, again, that first project list. And I'm gonna guess that all of the needs of Aquia in areas nearby are probably not gonna be met in the first iteration of the plan. And that's okay. Places all across the state are gonna have their needs not fully met. And the thing is, is when you make a plan like this, something so big and ambitious, you gotta start somewhere. So we started with what we had, knowing all along that that's not gonna be perfect and it's not gonna solve every problem, but it's where we're starting. And here's where all of you come in. So this is gonna be a, hopefully a forever project for the Commonwealth, right? We want to have started this, but for it to go on and on long after the election and the next governor and the next governor. And the way it's set up to work is to continually be a conversation between localities and the state. And that means the localities need to figure out slow over time what they need and to keep working with the master plan people. And when you come up with your next project, make sure you update the spreadsheets or the, the forms and get it in the next version. Because ultimately, um, we are gonna start to steer the funding towards the things we're prioritizing to a degree. And we don't want anyone to be left behind, as we said. So I'm here to remind you, to tell you, to ask you to stay involved I promise you this is going to turn into something. We just put out our first round of grants. Um, it's exciting, and we're going to do a second round. In, I think the grant round closes November 5th. We're going to talk about that more in a second, but this is starting to happen. So with regard to the master plan, elected officials, those of you here who work with elected officials, stay involved, keep generating projects, keep feeding them into the master plan, and over time, that's gonna make sure that the state has a master plan that is helping your community. And if everybody does it, all communities. Does that make sense? Are good? All right. Let's go back one and then we'll go forward again. Sorry. Um, and we'll talk about the flood fund because that's where it gets real. And actually, let me just pause for one moment. You had mentioned, yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Monica. Monica, thank you. You mentioned, when we spoke kind of before it started, uh, you talked about some legislation. And I think you meant legislation that would continue to make this as permanent as I just described it. Yeah, and you're right, that legislation didn't happen. Um, and I guess I, I, I don't wanna to say too much, but I can say, I think that people are continuing to work on that legislation, and I think you're gonna see it come back. I called our delegate right away. Did you know about this? <laughs> so we want this to be forever permanent. Like I said, Governor Northam wants that. Um, he's you know basically treated all of this through executive order. So a new governor could change things if they wanted to. Um, and we're trying to to have as much of this in shrine legislation so we can be guaranteed that it will continue to provide for the state. So with that, I'm going to talk about something that is in the legislation and that or that has been legislated, that is law. And that is called the Community Flood Preparedness Fund. Um, that's a lot of words. I'll skip that. But the flood fund is meant to do this. It's meant to help communities deal with flooding in lots of ways. So can we go back? Can we jump to wherever I wanted to be when you're ready? One more. Huh? One more? I guess forget it. Um, let's just talk. Here's how the flood fund works. There is something called REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Has anyone heard of that before? Okay. That is a program that caps carbon emissions from coal, or pardon me, from fossil fuel generating power plants. Um, and the way it limits those emissions 
is by setting an allocation that power plants can use. And for everything over that, they need to buy credits for additional pollution. And that happens quarterly in an auction for all the states involved. And every quarter, we get a significant amount of money from that auction. And the General Assembly passed a piece of legislation that says, when we get that big chunk of money every quarter, 45% uh, of the money is going to go to the Department of Conservation and Recreation for this fund. And based on our early estimates, that was going to be a 75 to $80 million a year. And that's every auction so far, has, the price has gone up. And now I think we're looking at more like 100 to 120 million a year, if things continue as they are, to go to counties and localities, PDCs, uh, Virginia Indian tribes, and soil and water conservation districts. Those are the people who can apply for this grant. And there are three types of grants in the Community Flood Preparedness Fund. So, and I think they all sort of apply to some of the conversation we just had. So, first, our study grants. We'll start there. And that means there's some stuff that everybody needs to figure out so they can do good planning. So the two experts from the planning department probably want really good rainfall data. Um, you know, it sounds like you were going to do some studies on how altered hydrology is being impacted by development, things like that. Um, maybe I'm wrong about those things. But like, am I kind of, you get, is that fair enough? Oh, um, you can apply to the flood fund for money to conduct studies if you need to figure things out. That's one use of the fund. The second use is capacity building. And capacity building means everything from having a certified floodplain manager to some of the studies you're probably hiring consultants to do to evaluate projects and develop projects. Um, same group of people can apply for those grants. And then last, but certainly not least, is this fund will pay for projects. Now, there are a few requirements. We want to make sure that people, as we've discussed, are doing good planning, are being thoughtful and holistic about it. So we do require that a locality submits a resilience plan of some kind. It's fairly loose. It's described in the grant manual. It just has some minimum criteria. It was designed so that localities um, could take existing plans and documents that they might have and aggregate them and not have to reinvent the wheel. And I think we've already approved seven or eight of them. Uh, yeah. I don't know if we've approved one for you. Yeah, I don't think. She's our so you're working on so you're working on it. Okay. So we haven't applied for sorry, we haven't applied for anything, but TWS came from then their plan was announced for three last week. Oh. So and then I contacted County Admin and our we can come under the I might be out of the loop. I don't need specifics, but it has to be a local plan. So you need to be one of them to adopt. Um, it is confusing for localities, and it's confusing for a lot of stakeholders because the, the requirements of the resiliency plan have not been very specific. Um, and it is generally taking a certification plan and taking that plan all together. Um, so we started striking out on our own to have a consultant develop a resiliency plan, unbeknownst to us. The PDC was also working a resiliency plan concurrently. So we've kind of tapped the brakes on that to kind of see if we can just sort of go under GWRC's plan and adopt that. Does become tricky if the plan becomes this living document where projects get added by different localities that make up the PDC. Do those plans need to be readopted every year as projects are added? I mean, so that becomes kind of tricky. So, so let, me, let, let me pause. Let's open that one. I heard you, you didn't like, that's my fault. So let me just, for them, say, we learned some questions about this, the approvals of these community plans and how that works. So let me just touch on a couple of points. First, to the extent that you feel like it might be confusing more than clear, 
right? The, the goal was to try to, to make it sort of easy-ish for people to onboard, not to be confusing. And what I would say first is call DCR. If you haven't actually had a conversation about it, the best thing to do is just call and talk it through because they'll be helpful to you. I've seen them work through with other localities and PDCs on the plan. And I think that's just the easiest. So you maybe you've done that already, but start there. If there's problems, we can keep talking, but that's on that, that's the best thing to do. Um, with regard to what you were saying next, right, about how the list of, in the plan and it ties to the living document and things like that. What I think you were articulating was maybe kind of blending two things together. So what we are asking of communities is not a detailed project for only plan like the master plan will be, right? Um, it can be broad enough so that you come back and ask for projects that are not necessarily fully articulated. In. Does that make sense? Well, I think when you look at the grant manuals, there are very specific uh, a specific project or construction plan has to be in the resilience in order to be eligible for funding. This is a brand new road. Yeah. And we're putting a hundred million dollars out there and we want it to get that Reggie thing until January. So it's all really new. And I would say everything is evolving. So talk to DCR, you know, when the next grant manual comes out, and it'll be right on the heels of this one. It'll be grant run after grant run. Just explain it and, and we'll fix it. We've been yeah. involved. I mean, I'm just saying we have been involved. We've been stakeholders in the NAMSA throughout this process and given our feedback too. So we are engaged. We'll continue to engage with DCR, but we are just seeing like it's be really able to be able to take advantage of some of the project specific stuff. There are strings attached to that. There are certain criteria that have to be met. One of them is, you know, it being part of your resiliency plan, project specific resiliency plan to be eligible for this sort of I think you could do something like say, in this general area, this approach, and that kind of gets you is what they're looking for. Um, so anyway, back to sort of the, the top level, this flood fund. Um, does have a lot of money, does potentially have a few little problems, but if you stick with it, I guarantee you there's money there. Um, the money is tiered also. So a low-income community will pay much less match than a, uh, than a community that is more affluent. A project that is more in line with some of the concepts I talked to you about in the beginning, community-wide, um, ensuring no one's left behind, using best available science, using natural approaches when we can, um, those are going to get a better match because those are things that the state has an interest in pushing. Yes. Sorry, I have a question. Uh -huh. um, as far as the scaling for communities and funding, um, are you referring to the, the specific areas where the flooding or issues are occurring or a district wide or how does, how does that look at? That's a great question because. That's a good question because it's come up some as we've done our first grant round. And what we couldn't do is draw the circle to it. So we couldn't say, you know, Quiet is part of a whole region. And if you kind of average out the whole region, right? I think we have to be looking sort of in the project zone, right? Is what is the community level? Right, so what we talk about in the, in the code and things is um, using the uh, federal government's uh, HUD rankings for those sorts of things, their, their criteria. And yes, I think it's actually smaller than the census block. I'm not an expert on this part. Um, and I know that that has been talked about, and I'm sorry that I can't get more. No, that's okay. So those are all things designed to sort of push it forward. And I think now if we just jump one or two slides, it's going to just sort of say where you go to follow along. One more, yeah. Um, and that's where you, the places you say they'll keep up on this after I turn into a pumpkin on January 15th and a new administration comes in. Um, and the last thing I just want to say is, I think I said this earlier, but over time, we will keep adding points into the flood fund to tie it all together. 
And at some point, when it's ready, what you will see is if you are applying for a grant for a project that is identified specifically in the master plan, let's say for a road, for example, the space was that's of great significance and we need that one. Well, then when you apply for it, you will get extra bonus points to rise you up higher in the, you know, because it's competitive grant, rise you higher in the rankings, so you will potentially be more likely to get money. Right now, we have a wonderful problem where we have enough money to go around right now, but that's not going to last. Um, so, again, I'll leave you with the final reminder that you need to just keep making sure this all fits together, that you keep recommending projects and things both so you can just get funding from the flood fund and then long term so we can make sure that you're getting money from the flood fund in, in concert with the master. Does that all make sense? So you have, now we're going to just have a conversation where I'm going to stop showing you slides and we can just talk it. Is that good? Will the localities or, or all of us that are in this group right now, will we be able to have any influence on the decision criteria knowing that we don't really have it? But you know, for the next round of grants when we get to So there's a grant that is out right now that ends November 5th. And that one, the grant manual is done and the criteria are all set, and that will change. But when we do all sorts of grant programs, we update the grant manuals at least once a year and sometimes more. And those go through the, um, those are required to go out for public comment. And this one posted for, pardon me, the first time around, they posted for public comment. I don't think it changed, so I don't think it posted again the second time. But yes, you would need to watch for the next posting and, and as a county, as a PC, whatever it is, is submit comments and, and reach out directly to the DCR and talk. Yeah, I see comments on the program. Yeah, and I believe I've been for now being able to see the impact of that. So that would be the next round would be making money in the program. We need the public to comment and help us make it better. We know, like I said in the beginning, we're starting a long journey. Any other questions? Anything else people want to talk about? Did that help at all? Yes. Um, there we go. Um, my question was sort of when the project plans are submitted, does it have to be something specific? This is exactly what we want because you know some things will be cost prohibitive, prohibitive, prohibitive um, as far as what we can afford as a county. Yet the plan that we really need, we may be able to have done with access to the funds. So, um, are we able to submit different things concurrently and say, "Hey, what, what are we able to access as far as funds, and what can we, you know, what would work best?" Does that am I making sense? I think. Or do we have to submit one solid thing and say, "This is exactly what we want"? Okay. So for the community plan, it just gets you in the door that says, okay, now you can apply for the big project money. But that we had a, that was our conversation was about. And I think there was a little discrepancy where it might feel like you have to be super specific and get every project you want into that plan. And having seen some of the other places, I can tell you that's just not where it is for everybody. So I think you could probably suggest more. With approaches and problems without getting all the way in. So saying we have this book road problem and the creek and we're exploring solutions, but right, you may not know the final idea of what you want to do, but I think that you could probably get approved in the context of a community plan that way. You want to say something? Well, I just think really because I think this is going to take on the same thing as slab and some of the other projects from the state has worked. A lot of these projects, the county is going to have to have this kind of sort of at a design level stage or a construction plan level stage where they know what the cost is going to be because this is going to be a reimbursable grant. So the county is going to have to put some of this stuff in potentially into a CIP um, in order to show that the county has the ability to match the state to be able to pay for the project. I do think it's going to be. I just, and I, and I just, 
And I'm not, I'm trying to be, uh, I'm not trying to be critical or anything like that. I'm just trying to be realistic too. Um, some of the other things that just give me a little bit of concern is I do think like this grant, um, I don't know that it'll solve some of the flooding issues if it's just looking at green infrastructure and not going to form traditional gray infrastructure. It solves everything. Okay. It's just we want, like, when we can do green, it means choice, right? We prefer, and I don't even like green, I like to say the nature based approach, mm -hmm. right? We like to work with the water rather than fight the water. That's better. Um, so we will give a slightly better match for the more. Uh, nature-based project, and that's the state's way of saying this is what we value. But absolutely, a hardened project can be funded by the flood fund, yeah. and will be. My sense is that just the project has to be a little more shovel ready um, than it might be anticipated in order to receive grant funding to execute the project. Yeah. So back to this question, right? The the plan still. I think you're keep drilling back to the actual application for the project. So I, I told you what I can tell you about the plan, and I think sure. what you can get away with, and I'll stand by that. And if you need me to call someone, I will. And on the project, I hear you. So when you're in your early design stages and stuff, apply for like a capacity grant to do that. And then when you're ready to move dirt, then you apply for the project. It's just how you go. Yeah. It's there. Yeah. Okay. That is your question as well. Okay, perfect. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Is the channel for submission county to state or county to DWRC and then the state? Uh, both. Yeah, both, both. So a planning district commission can apply for a grant on behalf of a locality or the group of localities if they have the permission of the locality, right? We can't just have them get up and say they're doing it regardless, but with the locality's buying, they can do that. Or a locality can apply directly. Uh, both work for capacity reasons, or if you're doing kind of a, a macro project, you might want to go to the PDC level. But um, we have seen most localities applying in one PDC thus far. Um, you know, that's a choice. Those are choices of the local governments. Whatever's more expedient. Either way can work. I'm sorry. Either way can work. That's correct. Yes, sir. Can um, you get him the mic? I'm Adam from Yes. Uh, so I know down Brook Road, kind of complex situations. There are. Uh, title influences coming up from the front side, but there's also influences coming from the mine by the side, runoff influences. Like I know uh, a couple of years ago, I drove down Brook Road and I saw a freshly dug ditch with somebody's car uh, that sort of used to be a spongy marshy area. And I'm wondering, like, those sorts of things are in the contract, are they contributing to the coastal flooding? Where do you guys draw the line between what's eligible for this program? Does it have to be stuff that's directly getting inundated from the tidal side, or is it other um, factors that are affecting those populations? Um, the flood fund is for flooding period of any kind anywhere in the Commonwealth version. Cool. Great. That was easy. Okay. Thank you. Anything else we should talk about? I have one question. Yeah. Um, so, one of the big things I'm concerned with is game of safety. Um, we have a lot of things in the county that not the PCRs standards, um, like the game of safety um, the common regulations. And a lot of these are service district games. We have several service district games that we are trying to. Um, Bring those up so that they can get their full certificate as well. Upgrade these spillways and things like that. Does the service district have the ability to apply for a At present, no, it's just those groups I mentioned. Yeah, so um, that would be the locality. Yeah. But I'd also say in that context, right? So there is a dam safety fund, I'm sure you know about it. Right. Program. 
it's always underfunded. I think that's the contention. Everything is underfunded. It's always it's, it's, it's underfunded. And it's it's you know it's very specific. Like you know DCR is a big part of it right now is low level drains, which don't make a lot of sense on a lot of legacy dam projects to put low level drains on those. So that's where a lot of the focus has been recently. But we have dams that are struggling to get into compliance, and there is no alternative without the state's help to try to get those facilities into compliance and funds. I get it, I hear you. Yeah. So, you know, and we talk about that in the, you know, in our office, and I guess I'd say I don't have the perfect solution to that, and, and you, you're right, but what I will say is, um, one, by creating this flood fund, you know, we are freeing up money that can stay in the dam safety fund. And, we are hoping that people can apply for this fund also for certain dam upgrades. And frankly, it's going to be more money. So, you know, what we would think is we're trying to make that better. We're cognizant of that problem. We're trying to make it so there is more money. But I am I 100% agree. And dams in Virginia keep me up. And, and they're tied to resiliency. So, that's... so uh, what I can tell you is in the context of like the master plan, in Virginia, dams should be part of it. That is not very much part of the conversation right now because people aren't friendly to the conversation. Um, the flood fund should help the dam problem, but it's not going to until someone applies to use it for a dam, right? It's a brand new program, right? So until someone uh, you know, is that first person or first locality, it just it's not a thing the fund does. So that's not meant to be evasive or anything. It's to say that I'm with you and this is what we're able to do right now. And I know it's, I know dealing with state government is frustrating and there's a lot of forms and things, but the reason we're coming to all these places to say we are making significant new resources available. We're trying new things. So hang in there, keep applying, keep trying. I promise it's going to be. We're, we're going to do what we need to do to take advantage. We're going to where we can try and push what we can push. So we'll definitely hear you. Okay. Oh, I was just going to say, kind of like what he was uh, responding to you just now, that what, what I hear you saying is if we want it to be covered, we should be starting now as it's developing and growing to apply for it so it becomes, okay, this is a normal thing coming through. This is something not only will it help us, but all other people later when they have the same issues. So it becomes a, a thing that's normal to, to cover it like it is. And I'm telling you, my friends who work in state government are waiting for those applications. All right. That's what we talked about. That's what we want. Yep. I heard you say that I really think it's cool is that what you're saying is that when we come up with ideas and looking at your guide, and I call it a grant guide, I call it something. So when we're looking at that and we see something that doesn't quite fit, give you guys a call. That's yeah. what I'm hearing you say. Yes. And it's like, it didn't see it. But it might not be me because the election will happen. Yes. Sorry, I have that. Okay, but that's what I'm hearing you say. Yes. And I like it because um, there's like, some things I'm going to be calling about. It. It is just, but it's just, I think that there are huge opportunities. I just didn't realize that was going to be kind of what we need to do. Great. All right. Any, yes, sir. I'll bring in Mike. This is a little bit off tangent, but I, I think it's important um, for government to know this is a political problem. It's just the reality. I think that we're always shopping for big projects and huge dollars. Um, but there's a incredibly kind of powerful resource out there that we would often don't take advantage of. And that's one person, one family. You know, they want to go in and, and take care of um, some uh, low lying issue. Or they want to build a bulkhead at the back of their property to make sure they don't wash it in the river um, or something along those lines. I, I think a lot of people just very overwhelmed by the regulation, the permitting, the costs, um, the engineering studies, and they say, Heck, I'm not going to do it. They can move there because at the hand basket, oh, so nothing's going to go out. You know, and then it costs you know, um, Small edits are, um, I found it really quiet. And if I call it a small area, we can get more estimates and stuff like that. Um, we were putting in like small plans down to one of the people that are really 
systems um, to the same uh, bridge and boardwalk uh, that failed because we had to come in less than the three and the um, cost that we had set up a plan to actually put in uh, a fiber and, and drop in the draft and things of that nature because this one of the was pretty good. We were going to take care of about 3,000 bucks, but Engineering plan was required, and we just couldn't pull those sorts of resources together. Six to eight months after that, where we had a big flood coming down Boston Run, it almost blew out that bridge, and we found quite hard to have spent tens of thousands of dollars to reconstruct that shoreline and shore park. Yeah, boardwalk is the only reason we could build. So, I just want to say that very small groups and even individuals can contribute great amounts of resources that would prevent a big government from having to spend huge resources that they could have been taken care of a little bit more easily if, if the government had a little bit more leadership uh, around some of the, the regulation and permitting on, on those sorts of things. So it's just kind of something that big lives. individuals can make a big impact here. Thank you for that. There were a lot of things that you had kind of embedded in, in what you said. Let me address some of them. Um, so, no doubt, Virginia is a state that has a tremendous amount of property in private hands, privately owned property. And then another huge amount of property, Virginia is owned by the federal government. Um, so, we can't deal with our resiliency issues in Virginia without figuring out a way to work on private lands. Um, that said, you know, in, in bulkheading, uh, wind shorelines, riprap, all really important things to do and really helpful. From the perspective of an agency like uh, DCR, if we are doing $1,000, $2,000 grants to individuals, which you described would be great. It's a capacity issue, right? We're getting so many grants at that point that I don't know that we have a step. So what we prefer right now, at least, and it can change, but is if a locality comes in and asks for, you know, on behalf of a group of property owners and can help do sort of a solution to a, a stretch of shoreline or stuff, that's what we're able to do right now. And I get that it would be better for you if we could do more. And maybe that can be at some point as they continue to stack it up. But right now, I just wanted you to understand why it is the way it is. And it's really a capacity. I just want to mention though, yeah. this is private funding, not government funding. Oh, right. Right. So, I mean, so a homeowner wants okay. to, to uh, build a bulkhead back on their property to stabilize their foundation. And maybe one of those could be that nature. Should they be allowed to do that? So it's all volunteers that be allowed to get the thousand bucks on a local fund, not the big government fund. We say we first have to understand. And then I understand right. And then you know, for a group like that, permitting can sometimes be a challenge. Uh, you know, permit thing is of course based on state law, um, and state regulation. So um, certainly, you know, a good thing to keep flagging for, for government as they develop new regulations or deal with the Bay Preservation Act or things like that. Um, but not necessarily something the master plan is going to yell. Yeah. Yeah. Make sense? Absolutely. Is there anything else that I can help answer? Anything else people are curious about or want to talk about? Anything else that we should know as we go back and keep working on this stuff? No comments on chat? Okay, well then let me do two things. First, I just want to thank you all because I always learn something and it's always interesting. Thank you for coming out and spending some time with us. And then if you'll stay for five more minutes, we'd like you to do one exercise with us that um, we always ask people to do with the other So up here, we have a really big map of your area and there are some post-its and markers and, and different things. But if you wouldn't mind, um, if there's an area where it floods that you're concerned about, just come draw a circle on it or show us or just, you know, just so we can take it back. We'll capture again all of this conversation is captured and there's notes from everyone to get review by our team and things so we can you know, be informed by these conversations. But if you would just help me with that one more thing before you go, we'd appreciate it so much. And then I should remind you that there's cookies on the back, maybe some pop in the, in the cooler. Um, so help yourself. And we stick around for a little bit if anyone wants to chat. So thank you all so much and have a great night. Thank you for having us here. We appreciate it. Thank you.